On August 26, 2025, what should have been just a normal afternoon flight in a Cessna 172S turned into absolute tragedy near Los Banos, California. The pilot, 31-year-old Mahesh Chigurapati of Santa Clara, was flying solo, and sadly, he didn't make it. What makes this case really stand out is what he told air traffic control. He had to keep pulling back hard on the yoke, constantly, just to keep the airplane from nosing over. That's not turbulence. That's not weather. That's something truly unusual. And the big question we're going to dig into here is, how does one of the most common and reliable training airplanes suddenly become almost unflyable, even with hours of help from controllers, instructors, and other pilots in the air? Mahesh took off from Reed Hillview Airport in San Jose around 3.20 that afternoon. Everything seemed routine at first, but just about an hour later, around 4.29, his voice came over NorCal approach. He declared an emergency. His words were clear. He was having to hold constant aft pressure on the yoke, or else the airplane wanted to dive nose down. Now that's not a small complaint. In a Cessna 172, the controls are usually light and forgiving. If you're having to fight the yoke that hard, something is seriously wrong in the pitch system, whether it's trim, elevator, or maybe even an autopilot issue. And here's the really crazy part. The ADS-B data backs this up. It shows the airplane's altitude bobbing up and down in small oscillations, like the pilot was constantly fighting for stable pitch. It wasn't weather, because the day was perfect VFR. Clear skies, about 10 miles visibility, light winds. So right away, it looked like a control system problem, not environmental. And this is a huge lesson for us as pilots. Even on a picture-perfect day, when the engine's humming along just fine, a mechanical control issue can be every bit as dangerous as an engine failure. What's remarkable, and honestly heartbreaking, is how long Mahesh kept this battle going. He stayed airborne for over an hour after that emergency call, trying to wrestle with the controls and troubleshoot the problem. That's an extremely frustrating situation to be stuck in. He wasn't completely on his own, though. Other airplanes in the area flew close by to visually inspect his Cessna. They reported back, flaps looked normal, retracted, and there was no obvious damage visible from the outside. So whatever was happening, and it was probably internal, something with trim or elevator linkages, a TC did a great job too. NorCal patched in the operator's chief instructor, who tried to walk Mahesh through troubleshooting steps over the radio. And get this, another airplane actually launched out of Los Banos just to go help him line up and try to land. The amount of teamwork here, pilots helping pilots, instructors stepping in, that's truly the one positive thing in this entire story. But here's where we have to pause and analyze. Mahesh had declared an emergency yet he continued flying around for a long time. It's possible he was hoping for a fix, or just trying to buy himself time. But when you're holding continuous control pressure for that long, you're burning both mental focus and physical stamina. It's exhausting. And in hindsight, again, not to criticize, but to learn, it may have been safer to commit to an immediate off-airport landing earlier, while still alert and with more altitude to work with. That's a tough call for any pilot, but it's a key lesson. When an aircraft just isn't controllable, sometimes land as soon as possible really is the only play, even if that means picking a field. Waiting it out can reduce your odds as fatigue builds and daylight runs short. As the flight wore on, things finally came to a head. The ADSB track shows the Cessna descending through about 3,000 feet then tightening into a right-hand spiraling descent. It wasn't a clean, controlled approach. It looked more like the aircraft was being pulled down while the pilot was struggling to keep it level. Other pilots were still with him, trying to help him set up for an off-airport landing in a farm field. And for a brief moment, there was hope. The data shows the airplane actually clawed back up from about 1,600 feet to 1,800. But almost immediately after that, the descent resumed, this time sharp and unrecoverable. A first responder's video captured the heartbreaking end. The airplane pitched down steeply, 
almost vertical, and slammed into the ground. The wreckage told the same story. The engine shoved back into the cockpit, wings crushed in accordion folds, debris spread tightly around the impact crater. That's exactly what you'd expect from a steep, nose-down crash at high energy. It's in these final moments that disorientation, overwhelming workload, and sheer exhaustion probably played a role. When you've been holding heavy pressure on the controls for over an hour, trying to troubleshoot, trying to coordinate with other aircraft, all while knowing your options are running out, that's a recipe for mistakes. It doesn't mean the pilot did anything wrong, it just shows how brutally unforgiving these situations can be when mechanical issues strip away the normal safety margins. So, what could have caused this? Again, this is early analysis, not a conclusion, but the symptoms point to the pitch control system. Having to constantly pull back means the airplane naturally wanted to nose down. That narrows it down to a few possibilities. First, trim runaway. In Cessna 172 with electric trim, if the system runs away nose down, it can create extremely heavy forward forces. In fact, in some trim runaway cases, pilots literally can't overpower the control pressure for long. That's one real possibility here. Second, a mechanical jam or failure. A stuck trim actuator, broken linkage, or something binding in the control cables could lock the trim or the elevator in a nose-heavy position. And the tricky part? Those failures often don't leave anything visible to other pilots flying alongside. Exactly what we saw here, where outside observers reported the plane looked normal. Third, the autopilot connection. Now, the operator reported that this airplane's autopilot had been disabled and placarded as inoperative since May. But here's the catch. Autopilot servos are often tied into the trim system. Even if you're not actively using it, a stuck servo or faulty wiring can still push the trim around. So investigators will almost certainly be looking at whether the autopilot hardware played a hidden role. That's why, in the final report, the NTSB will go methodically through the whole control system, check every cable, pulley and bell crank for continuity, tear down the trim actuator and motor to see if it jammed, inspect the autopilot servos, and wiring for shorts or lockups. From the outside, we can only speculate on these scenarios, but the one thing we can be sure of is that the pitch axis was compromised, and until the NTSB's final report, we won't know which piece of the puzzle failed. Now let's step back and talk about the human side, because that's just as important. Holding heavy back pressure on the yoke for more than an hour is brutal. Think about it. That's like doing a long, shaky arm workout while also trying to talk to ATC, run checklists, and plan a landing. The physical strain alone can wear you out, but add the mental stress, and it's almost impossible to stay sharp. And then there's decision making. It's very human to keep troubleshooting, hoping to figure it out while still airborne. But the trade-off is that fuel burns down, daylight fades, and your own endurance slips away, in hindsight. And I say this with total respect to Mahesh. It might have been safer to commit to an off-airport landing earlier, while he still had more altitude and strength. That's a lesson for all of us, not a criticism. So what are the takeaways? First, know your trim, runaway, recognition, and recovery procedures. Practicing that in a sim, or with an instructor, can pay off big if you ever see it for real. Second, be ready to fly without trim. It's ugly, it's exhausting, but it's possible. And third, don't brush off autopilot or trim squawks. If something's placarded or behaving strangely, treat it seriously before you go flying. The real bottom line here is this. Even in one of the most common, most trusted training aircraft, rare mechanical failures can still happen. And when they do, your preparation and your decisiveness are what really matter. At the end of the day, this was the loss of a young pilot, Mahesh Chiguru Pati, and my thoughts are with his family and friends. Everything we've discussed today is based only on the NTSB preliminary report. The final findings are still to come, and that's where the real answers will be. In the meantime, I'd love to hear from you. What's the one safety lesson you take away from this accident? Drop it in the comments below. And if you want to follow along when the final report comes out, make sure to subscribe so you don't miss it.